to kind of emphasize that as we move forward into the midterm exam, that we're going to be asking you questions that are kind of asking you then to pull together the information that you know and to try to synthesize this information. Okay? And again, I want to emphasize at the end of every lecture, I've given you a series of questions. And please, please start after the end of every class, I would like you to go back over those questions, flag the questions that you're not too comfortable with, any questions that you may be having difficulty with, and use those questions then to help you study. But also don't hesitate to reach out to us if you have any sort of questions. Um, if you want to meet to go over then how we would answer those questions, you know, please, um, please contact me, contact Jocelyn, come to our office hours. Um, let us know how we can kind of best help you. Again, I've said this a few times, but please form study groups if you haven't done so already. It really does help. Okay, so without further ado, we're going to launch right into the angiosperms. Now, I'm presuming that everybody can see my main presenter slide and not, um, not my notes, correct? Correct. All right. Yes, you can see it. Excellent. Hey, Jocelyn. Um, actually, which reminds me, Jocelyn, would you like to uh, use a little bit of time to chime in with any sort of thoughts or uh, items that we should be discussing? Uh, no, at this time, um, I don't have any updates. Thank you, though. Okay, excellent. Yeah, Jocelyn, don't hesitate to, to chime in if I should go astray. All right, great. All right, thank you. All right, so overview of last lecture, we've emphasized not only the main synapomorphy, but the suite of traits associated with the evolutionary success and ecological success than of the angiosperms, in particular, double fertilization, the carpal, the flower, and the fruit. And last time we focused on flower anatomy, we focused some, some aspects on flower symmetry, parts of the flower, remember, we talked about things like the perianth, the corolla, right? We talked to some degree about the importance of pollination and diversity. We're gonna come back to this later on um, in the class when we start talking more about co-evolutionary relationships between plants and animals, as well as the importance of fruit, right? So we spent quite a bit of time talking about flower morphology, but also uh, what fruit actually are, okay? So for today, what we're going to do is then finish up this last part of this component of putting together the angiosperm backbone phylogeny, okay? And so I kind of got to give you some hints that there are going to be several different groups, okay, that we're going to be focusing on. And today, that's what we're going to be doing. I'm going to give you the phylogeny that I would like you to memorize but in particular, the placement of each of these different groups, the anidagrade, the magnolias, the monocots, the rosids, the caryophyllales, and the asterids, okay? And in doing so, I'm also gonna be focusing on some key synapomorphies then associated with these subclades kind of within the angiosperm phylogeny, okay? So we'll be focusing on the major patterns of angiosperm character evolution, all right? So again, to remind yourself, these are the key evolutionary innovations of the angiosperms, double fertilization, carpal, flower, and fruit, okay? So the success of the angiosperm had to do with this entire package, okay? And together, these novel innovations then enabled angiosperms to do things that no other land plant could or can possibly do. All right, so let's go through and do an overview of the survey of the angiosperms, all right? Now, if you go on the angiosperm phylogeny website that's housed at the Missouri Botanical Garden, you can kind of explore and delve in deeper. You can click on each one of these taxa. You can understand in much more you know, gory detail the placement then of any angiosperm in terms of where they end up on this angiosperm phylogeny. Okay, now because they're the most speciose group on the planet in terms of plants, land plants, um, their phylogeny is, well, complicated, okay? There's a lot of taxa, a lot of different clades, grades, subgroupings, and so on. All right, so we're gonna take this complicated angiosperm phylogeny and we're gonna make it simplified, okay? Now, before doing so, I wanna also emphasize to you that there is another kind of key trait associated then 
with the angiosperms. And that is a key trait associated with the xylem anatomy. Now, we haven't talked a lot about xylem yet, but we're going to be talking about xylem in the next proximate lectures coming up. But xylem is a key vascular tissue associated with the evolution of the tracheophytes. Okay, so if you remember the tracheophytes then is another kind of clade then within the embryophytes, in particular, the vascular plants. Okay, so the key synapomorphy then of the vascular plants, the tracheophytes, is this first pipe known as the tracheid. Okay, and so tracheids then are present then across all of the tracheophytes. But then once we get into the angiosperms, we see this second pipe, an evolution of the second pipe. And the second pipe is much shorter and it's much wider. It's much bigger than these other previous pipes or tracheids, okay? And so within angiosperms, we see both tracheids and another pipe known as the vessel, okay? And so vessels are basically present in nearly all angiosperms, okay? Now, in general, we don't necessarily say that vessels are a synapomorphy or a kind of key evolutionary innovation than of the angiosperms, because it turns out that the evolution of the vessel, this big tube, this big water conducting tube, turns out to be a little bit more complicated. And so I want to spend a little bit of time kind of early on talking about this other key evolutionary innovation, the angiosperm, the vessel, but note that actually it's a little bit more complicated in terms of the evolutionary history. Okay, so if you remember back from the hagen pusiel equation, remember where we had either um, resistance, hydraulic resistance, or the conductance, remember one is the inverse of the other. The resistance or the conductance depended on the fourth power dependency on the radius. So the larger the radius and of the tube, proportionally the less amount of resistance, hydraulic resistance then through that tube. So what we see with the evolution from tracheids to vessels is that vessels, because they have much wider radius, and if we use the hagen pusiel equation, we can then calculate that actually vessels have much higher rates of water conductance. And because of which they also have much lower resistance, okay? So the capacity then of a plant that has a vessel to conduct water is much higher. In fact, up to a hundred times higher than a plant than that only has these small narrow tubes known as tracheids. So again, recall the hagen pusiel equation, okay? So the evolution of the vessel then, which is also associated with the evolution of the angiosperms, is associated then with this dramatic increase in the ability then of plants to conduct water and nutrient transport, okay? A huge increase, about a hundred times increase in terms of its, the ability to transport resources per tube, okay? Now, where do we tend to see these big xylem tubes, okay? Some really big vessels. Well, it actually turns out that we see some of the biggest vessels in these plants known as lianas. So remember, lianas then are these tropical vines. They're woody vines. That's what a liana is. And so if you go to these lowland tropical forests, oh my goodness, you see these huge, big honking vines, right? And so lianas actually turn out to consist of about 25% of all plant species then in some tropical forests, okay? So lianas turns out to be not only quite diverse, but they tend to be quite prevalent. Okay. And if you look at the canopy foliage in most tropical forests, a good fraction of that canopy foliage is actually liana leaves. Okay. So if you see those, those photography, wonderful photographs and helicopter and airplane flyovers of tropical forest canopy. You down, look down below and you see all these wonderful leaves of the, of the forest, right? This canopy um, kind of view. It turns out that a lot of that foliage, a lot of that green actually is liana leaves, okay? So lianas are cool. They're, we call them structural parasites, okay? They, they rely then on the trunks of other trees in order to climb up 
and kind of parasitize their canopies. Okay. And so lianas don't invest in this massive trunk like a normal tree does. Instead, it kind of relies biomechanically on the support of other trees to get into the canopy. And because of which, they don't have a big cross-sectional stem in order then to supply all this leaf material in the canopy. And because of which we've seen selection then for increasingly larger and larger vessels within lianas to support all of this foliage, all this leaf biomass in the canopy. So we actually see some of the largest vessels on the planet within lianas. If you cut them open, sometimes you'll see TV shows or, or YouTube videos of, of these, you know, intrepid tropical explorers slicing open a liana stem and drinking water out of them. You can actually do that. There's only a few species that allow you to do that, but they have so much water within them because they have these huge tubes. And if you slice them open, basically the water can, can, can pour right out. Okay, only a few species actually does that. It's somewhat of a myth, but you can find some species and drink out of them, right? All right, so lianas, lianas are pretty cool. Huge vessels. Now, it turns out that having a really large vessel makes you susceptible to damage by freezing, right? And it turns out that once you get into really cold environments, you don't see these really big vessels. And in fact, really cold environments select then for plants that have really narrow, small tubes. Because if you get all of that water on the inside of these big, big vessels, if it gets really cold, that water can freeze. And if you've ever put like a soda or a pop can in the freezer, right? And you forget about it, right? Or a beer or something like that, and you forget about it and you come back like a day or so, it can explode, right? So when water freezes, it actually expands. And so you can have the same thing basically happening within plants, okay? Because we have a lot of water in this vascular system. And if it gets cold enough, that freezing can actually not only damage, but it can really disrupt uh, the hydraulic nature then of water transport in plants. And so cold environments, it turns out, selects then for plants that have really small narrow conduits, in particular trachids. And that's where we tend to see the last of the gymnosperms basically dominated. So in cold environments that are really prone then to freezing, and this cavitation then of the xylem stream selects then for much narrower tubes, in particular trachids. And so these slower growing conifers then dominate in these cold climates because trachids are much more resistant to this freezing cavitation. Okay. All right, so interesting. So there's this relationship with kind of freezing tolerance and then the size then of uh, these xylem tubes, either trachids or vessels. So you don't see really big vessels in these really cold environments. You only see big vessels in these warm lowland areas and think lianas and tropical forest. All right. So the evolution then of vessels is interesting. And I kind of alluded to this earlier. I'm showing you here a simplified phylogeny. If you notice here, as we work up then this phylogeny, we can see several gymnosperms, okay? We talked a little bit about cycads, ginkgos, conifers, and then the needum, okay? Needum then is a very interesting plant that we're gonna to get to in a little bit. But then here are the gymnos, I'm sorry, the angiosperms. Don't worry so much about the names of these groups, okay? We're gonna to get to this in a little bit. But in general, what we see with the evolution of the angiosperms, so this is some of the basal angiosperms and then the rest of the angiosperms are up here. We actually see, another trait kind of key associated with the evolution of angiosperms and that is the vessel, okay? And for the longest time, we thought that the vessel was a key, another key synapomorphy then of the angiosperms. But it actually turns out that once people started looking in more detail about the evolution as well as the loss of vessels, it turned out to be a little bit more complicated because it turns out that in some groups of angiosperms, a group of plants known as Amborella, which is a basal angiosperm, the Chlorianthales, Winteraceae, we actually see in some of these groups that they do not contain. There's some angiosperms that don't contain vessels, okay? which is interesting. 
And that was kind of a mystery. It's like, wow, you can actually lose some of these traits, a key trait that we thought was important to the Andrews sperms, the vessels. Well, it actually turns out that there's a gymnosperm that has vessels as well. Needham, it turns out, actually has vessels as well. And that's actually quite interesting. So in terms of the evolution of the vessel, we see within both the angiosperms and some gymnosperms, either the presence or absence of vessels. Okay, and so we can map this trait in the phylogeny. And so that brings up the big question, well, geez, what's, what's happening here? Did the vessels evolve only once? Did they evolve multiple times? What's happening with the evolution of the vessel? Well, it turns out that if you look at Needham, Needham is actually a gymnosperm, as I told you, <laughs> excuse me, but it's also a liana. It's a weird gymnosperm liana. And within Needham, this gymnosperm, we see, if you slice open, then the xylem on the inside, you see these big honking vessels surrounded by these smaller trachids. So within Needham, it appears as if we have the independent evolution of vessels within then this gymnosperm liana. So remember, lianas are these structural parasites. They don't have this big cross-section of stem, right, in order to support all this, this foliage then above them, right? So they have by necessity this smaller stem and because of which there's selection for increased hydraulic conductance. And so that looks as if was a, a, a novel selective environment for the independent evolution of vessels within this gymnosperm liana, okay? Because again, there was this demand, increased demand for the liana habit, there's selection for wider and wider tubes because you don't have that big of a stem because you're, you're a liana in order to support all of this foliage, okay? Now it turns out that within some of these basal angiosperms, as well as some other angiosperms, in some of these high elevation angiosperms, we see in high tropical mountains, tropical mountains that are really cold on top, okay? Remember in freezing environments, if you then are to invade a freezing environment, that would then select for individuals where your vessel and or trachea is not so big so that you don't have this freezing induced embolism or cavitation. And so high tropical mountains that are cold that can have freezing, we see in multiple times the secondary loss then of vessels. And so here is, here's Drymes, this is a genus of tropical tree that grows on these really cold high mountaintops in the tropics here in Costa Rica. All right, so that's really interesting. So we, if we go back to these other groups like Amborella, the Chloranthales, or Winteraceae, in all of these different groups, these then are taxa then that invaded these higher elevation tropical mountains with freezing. And it appears as if that's selected then for a reduction in your tube size or your xylem size, and therefore a loss then of vessels. So vessels then appear to have been gained and lost kind of multiple times, depending then on the local environment, in particular, the prevalence of freezing, okay? So we'll come back to vessels in a little bit, okay? So for now, what I would like to do, and for the rest then of the class today, is give you then this overview, this backbone of the angiosperm phylogeny. And here it is, okay? And so I alluded to this last week. This is the backbone of the phylogeny I would like you to memorize. And I would like, to, uh, you, I would like you to memorize this one, two, three, four, five, six groups. The anitagrade, the magnoliids, the monocots, rosids, caryophyllales, and the asterids, okay? So let's start with the Anita grade, A-N-I-T-A, -A, Anita grade. So remember with our, with our phylogenetic shorthand, so remember when we have this kind of like this big kind of block here kind of coming off then the base, this actually represents several taxa then that come off then kind of in unison off the backbone of the phylogeny here, these taxa. So the, the, it's a grade, it's not a clade itself, Okay, but it's actually a grade. And again, a grade refers to any taxon then kind of defined by physiology and morphology instead of kind of 
strict phylogeny because it's not a pure clade, okay? So we can zoom in, all right? So what I'm doing is I'm gonna zoom in here on the Anita grade. Now, I don't want you to memorize these groups at all. I mean, I can go through them, okay? Um, but for your own edification, the only thing that I would like you to memorize is just that there's several taxa here in these basal angiosperms. So these are the basal angiosperms then that make up the Anita grade. All right, so I'm kind of zooming in. Now, Amborella, okay, Nymphales, okay, Ostrobaleaceae, uh, Il Ilicaceae, Trimeriaceae. These are really cool basal angiosperms. So if you look at the first kind of spelling, first letter then in the spelling, kind of makes up Anita, okay, A-N-I-T-A. It's shorthand then for all these different families. Don't worry about the family names. I don't want you to memorize these. If you take an advanced plant taxonomy course, you'll get into all the lovely details of these families. Okay, so the Anita grade. All right, so these then are some of the, our extant basal angiosperms. So let's learn a little bit about them. Okay. So if you remember, I think last time I talked about star anise. In particular, star anise is really cool because remember in the evolution of the carpal, which is the synapomorphy of the angiosperms. A carpal then technically is this, is this enveloping then of your ovule with one integument to make the second integument, the carpal. Within star anis, you can actually see that that fusion, that formal fusion then all the way to make the, the carpal hasn't quite happened yet. In fact, when you buy star anis for your cooking, sometimes you can get the full kind of star here and you can actually see that they're still kind of split open. And if you look at the flower then of these Anita families, the flower parts tend to be really kind of irregular and really disheveled looking that kind of looks a little unkept. It's not your, your most beautiful flower that you've seen, right? And so there, a lot of these flower parts tend to be really numerous and it's kind of like this explosion of stuff happening kind of at the base. And the carpels are separate. You can kind of clearly see each of the carpels here. And they're kind of leaf-like. The stamens are kind of leaf-like. Um, the perianth isn't really differentiated in the sepals and petals. So if you remember from last time we talked about sepals, usually that green kind of inner world, that first world then of structures, leaf-like structures at the base. And then you get the petals, right? You get the, you get the sepals and then the petals. Well, within these Anita families, you can't differentiate between sepals and petals. In fact, they're the same thing. And in fact, we don't call these petals, we call these tepals, okay? They're known as tepals, meaning that they're both sepals and petals, okay? So we don't get this formal different, different, uh, differentiation, okay? So these disheveled looking flowers, really crazy, a lot, of, a lot, of, a lot going on. Right? Water lilies, another good example um, of you know, some of these uh, Anita families, right? So here's water lilies, look. Many different, you know, all these different, uh, what looks like petals, but these are actually tepals, remember? So we don't get um, very clear sepals or petals, okay? But we call what looks like petals here, tepals. All right, all right. so the Anita grade. If you notice, I didn't spend a lot of time, okay, on the Anita grade, because we don't have that much time in class. But let's walk up then the rest of the phylogeny. Magnoliates, okay. Magnolia, if you've, uh, if you've ever seen a magnolia tree, if you're from this, uh, the, the southeastern United States or have had the good fortune to visit there, magnolia trees, oh my gosh, they define the south. They're beautiful, beautiful flowers, right? And they actually consist of pretty diverse families. Uh, a lot of tropical trees, uh, in particular, high elevation tropical trees are magn magnoliids, okay, magnoliids. All right, so there's thousands of species of magnoliids, right? Mostly tropical trees. Their carpels tend to be separate again. So again, we have these separate uh, carpels. And sometimes they tend to be numerous or you tend to see them in threes, okay? In groups of threes. And the perianth, remember kind of our kind of flower parts, they start to be separated and organized in the perianth of either two or three, okay? So in general, this kind of, all of a sudden we start to see flower parts arranged in threes, okay? And this is gonna be very important because this is a very easy way for you to start to recognize some of these major 
angiosperm groups. Okay, so we start to see flower parts in trees. So here's in the uh, Lauraceae. Okay, if you're familiar with uh, bay leaf, if you've bay leaf in cooking, or if you find a magnolia tree, that smell, okay, that's typical of bay leaves for cooking, right? That tends to be very typical of uh, magnolia. So if you notice here, here's a uh, Lauraceae flower. So here, this is, it's not the most beautiful flower in the world, but if you just kind of check out this flower, see how they come in these worlds of three. So one, two, three, one, two, three. If you look, even look on the inside here, you start to see these worlds of three. So flower parts in threes then start to become present, okay? That tends to be kind of like a central organizational principle then of which a lot of the floral morphology is built, flower parts in threes. And we see that for the first time within the Magnoliads. All right, so Magnolia flower, okay? Here again, you can see flower parts in three. One, two, three, one, two, three. Tulip trees, if you've been to the United, Eastern United States, beautiful trees are right, these really nice flowers. Now, these petals though, again, they are not differentiated into sepals and petals. Instead, we call these tepals as well. So these are still tepals. We don't have them segregated into sepals and petals yet. So the carpels tend to be numerous and the stamens, there's a lot of stamens going on in here. Stamens are numerous. And again, the perianth tends to be in multiple groups of three. Okay, so kind of worlds of three. Wonderful fruits, oh my goodness. Some of the best tropical fruits ever. Anona, oh my gosh, ah, I crave Anona fruits. Ah, nutmeg, all right, avocados. Avocados is a magnolia, magnolia. Wonderful, wonderful fruits. Some of these fruits, this one, this type of fruit is known as a coliferous uh, uh, fruit and flowers. Um, don't memorize you know, the name so much, but sometimes within the magnolia, we tend to see flowers on the trunks then of trees. And so you can get flowers and fruits kind of produced in, in really weird kind of uh, different parts then of a plant, really cool. Okay, so we went through the Anita grade really quick, the Magnoliads, but now the monocots. Okay, and it turns out that the monocots, totally separate clade, a very important group of plants within the angiosperms, not only in terms of species diversity, but also in terms of humanity. All right, we actually rely on a lot of monocots. Monocots are really interesting, they're also bizarre because of their anatomy. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about what unique selective pressures basically led to the monocot anatomy in a little bit. Now, most monocots are herbs. Some are tree-like, okay, so palm trees, but all monocots lack true secondary growth, right? They don't have a true secondary growth pattern. And they also have their vascular bundles parallel and kind of scattered, right? And if you do a cross section then of a leaf or a stem, you'll tend to see these little vascular bundles all kind of separated all throughout. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about um, monocot xylem anatomy in, in the second part then of course, okay? And you can usually tell a monocot because they tend to have this parallel leaf venation. If you've ever seen a corn leaf or a grass blade, that parallel venation, right? Where the, where the uh, venation is parallel then to each other, that's typical of mini monocots, All right? Monocots are cool. So you can see this parallel venation in the leaves right there. This is typical monocot leaf. Think a grass leaf, right? So it turns out that the monocot leaf isn't necessarily a true leaf. In fact, the monocot leaf is homologous with the petiole of other angiosperm leaves. And so one aspect of plant morphology that we're going to get into in a little bit more detail has to do with the morphology then of a leaf. And for today, we're gonna to break down a leaf as consisting of a petiole, which is kind of the stalk, that's the branch then that then and attaches then the leaf to the main stem itself. 
right? So the petiole is that initial stalk, and then you have this leaf blade or lamina. So it turns out that all of that leaf that you see is really just a elongated petiole. It's not actually the leaf blade itself, but developmentally, it's actually the petiole of a leaf. So basically take a petiole of a normal leaf and run a steamroller over it, flatten it out and spread it out. A monocot leaf is a petiole, okay? And so we're gonna be going into a little bit more detail than about monocot leaves, but later. All right, so immediately then realize when we talk about leaves, remember there's many different types of leaves in terms of how they formally develop. We talked about microfills and megafills, but also remember in the bryophytes, they have these leaf-like structures that are totally different. They're basically this, this unrolling then of photosynthetic tissue, right? And because these bryophytes then don't have a formal vascular system, these are leaf-like structures without a formal vascular system. So we have microfills, megafills, but even then within the megafills, we then have another way of creating a leaf-like structure, basically elongated petioles and flattened petioles. Within the monocots, that's what we see. Cool. So monocots are also interesting because if you look at the term monocot, mono meaning one, they have one cotyledon, okay? All other plants that are not monocots have two cotyledons. Monocots have one, that's the first leaf. So remember, once then this developing seedling kind of emerges, that first photosynthetic leaf, that first leaf is a cotyledon that has all the stored endosperm within that triploid tissue. Monocots have one cotyledon. They also have flower parts and threes, just like the magnoliids. Within the monocots, we still see then this trait of flower parts and threes. So if you see different monocot flowers, such as this beautiful lily, if you get lilies from, from your local florist or supermarket, buy some lilies tonight, bring it home and admire the flower parts and threes. One, two, three, one, two, three. All of these different worlds of threes. Typical monocot ovary, if you split open then a monocot fruit, you'll see one, two, three flower parts and threes. Lily family, look at the flower parts and threes. One, two, three, one, two, three. All right, all these different worlds. Notice we don't have sepals and petals. Instead, we just have tepals. Okay, we just have tepals. Sepals and petals, oh my gosh. Amaryllis. Sometimes we see in certain groups a fusion. The sepals and petals are now fused into this long tube. Okay, we start to see tubular flowers in some groups. And in particular in this amaryllis, we can see then evolution of tubular-like structures in the flower. And that's gonna be very important, probably reflecting co-evolution between plants and animals. We'll come back to tubular flowers in just a little bit. Orchids, another great, great family, incredibly diverse. One of the most diverse angiosperm families on the planet. Okay, orchids, everyone loves orchids. Here within the orchids, we start to see bilateral symmetry. Instead of the radial symmetry that we've seen in most of the flowers up to now, within orchids, we start to see bilaterally symmetrical flowers, okay? And so if you notice within then the orchids, we still have this play on threes, one, two, three, one, two, three. Here's one, two, uh-oh. What happened there? Did the rule of threes not apply here? Well, actually it does because this one, two, third then tepal is actually highly modified. And so we can start to call this a petal because it's fairly further differentiated. This modification then is known as the lip, the lip then of the floral structure within an orchid. And we also get further elaboration of the flower, something known as the column. Now, orchids have very tight coevolutionary relationships with animals, in particular insects. And so we have then our three differentiated now sepals, okay, two petals, 
And now we have something known as a lip. So we start to see this differentiation within then the flower morphology itself. And so we can start to talk now of three sepals, two petals, and one lip. Okay. And this internal structure is something known as the column. Okay. So orchids, really cool, very tight coevolutionary relation, relationships then with animals. We'll come back to orchids in a little bit when we start talking about animal coevolution. All right, Poaceae. This is another family, big important family then within the monocots, the grass family. Wind pollinated. Selection then has reduced the flower sizes within grasses so that if you're, you have to get out your little hand lens and you actually see these small little flowers on the inside here. In fact, the sepals and the petals have been so reduced that basically we don't even talk about sepals and petals. And instead the flowers are grouped into these spikelets, okay? So highly specialized wind dispersed you know, flowers, a highly diverse group of plants, the grasses. And it turns out that grasses are very unique in terms of their physiology and their photosynthesis. In particular, they, they utilize a form of photosynthesis called C4 photosynthesis. We haven't talked about C4 photosynthesis, but we're going to be talking about the different flavors of biochemical pathways in, in photosynthesis in a little bit. Grasses, highly productive under warm, wet conditions because we've seen selection for this very important photosynthetic pathway known as C4 photosynthesis. All of our crop, well, not all of our crops, but a good chunk of our crops rely then on grass diversity, in particular sugarcane, corn, gosh, wheat, barley, and so on. But several then of these crop species rely on C4 photosynthesis. So gosh, probably if you like beer, bread, rice, this is your family, right? Economically, it's probably the most important plant family on the planet. Humanity relies on monocots. Wheat, barley, rice, corn, sugarcane, right? All found within the monocots. All right. Other cool monocots, palm trees, right? Everyone loves palm trees. Coconuts, okay, comes from these fantastic trees, palm trees then growing on South Asian uh, Pacific Islands. Great form of dispersal, by the way, from the ocean. So some of these palm trees, turns out can get really thick, okay? So it seems like maybe there has been this, uh, the um, independent evolution of secondary growth than some palm trees. We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, and when we talk more about secondary growth, some very interesting internal stem anatomy within palm trees. What's interesting about palm trees is that you only see palm trees in tropical regions. And that's interesting because monocots grow kind of throughout the world, including the Arctic, high mountain environments, environments that are really prone to freezing, okay? So we see monocots grasses in really cold areas as well as dry areas, but you only see palm trees in warm, wet tropical environments. So big question is, well, why is that? How come we don't have palm trees growing? You know, once you get outside of Tucson, how come you don't see palm trees going in, growing in North Dakota or Minnesota or up in Canada? Well, it turns out that the palm tree grows by one central meristem or this growing part then of the stem. And all of the leaves, this big explosion of leaf photosynthetic area at the top kind of comes out of that one meristem. So palm trees have what we call an Achilles heel, right? They have a weakness. And that one weakness is, is that if you kill that one meristem, if you lop off or somehow kill that meristem at the top, you no longer then can grow and you can no longer produce then leaves. And so palms are very susceptible to being killed at their meristem. And it turns out that meristems, that growing tip at the top are very sensitive to frost. Okay. And because of which palm trees, their distribution is set by the prevalence of frost and freezing conditions. They can't tolerate very much frost and freezing 
because of if they do, their meristem or their growing tip where they produce all these leaves tends to die. And so the entire plant is easily killed from freezing. That's why we see palm trees usually restricted to really wet and warm environments. Okay. Other monocots, really cool monocots. These are some of the best flowers if you go to a uh, either a flower show or you go to your, your kind of local flower dealer and you wanna get some really beautiful flowers, gingers, bananas, and, and their allies, right? Some of the showiest flowers are these monocots. And they still show the flower parts in threes, but we start to see these modified flower parts. And a lot of these modified flower parts, it actually turns out are not really showy tepals or petals or sepals, but instead the showiest parts of the flower are typically modified stamens. And we call these staminoids. They're not petals, right? So we start to see selection to modify other parts then of the flowers. And so we don't see these really elaborated petals, but instead elaborated stamens within monocots. And so if you've ever noticed, uh, seen uh, some of these costaceae flowers, beautiful flowers, really there's typical kind of tropical flower. You actually find developmentally that that flower itself, a lot of the showy part is indeed petals, but this really elaborated part of the flower is actually an elaborated stamen or what we've known as a staminoid. Right? So this crazy selection on different parts of the flower. All right. So whirlwind tour, the Anita grade, the Magnoliads, the monocots, and now we're getting basically to the meat and potatoes, then are the rest of the angiosperms, a group that is a separate clade, something known as the eudicots, the eudicots, or the true dicots. The eudicots are a clade consisting of the rosids, the caryophyllales, and the asterids, right? And it turns out that the key synapomorphy then for the eudicots is that instead of having flower parts that are undifferentiated, such as the Anita grade, or flower parts in threes, such as the Magnoliads and the Monocots, we see within the eudicots sepals and petals. We start now to talk about true sepals and petals, but in multiples of fours and fives, okay? So a key synapomorphy of the eudicots are flower parts in fours and fives instead of threes. Okay, so if you notice, there's a lot kind of going on here. And so we can make sense then of all of that diversity of the angiosperms in terms of breaking it down by the phylogeny and looking at the key synapomorphies then that characterize this incredibly diverse group. So the, our basal angiosperm common ancestor had flower parts that were very irregular and kind of numerous, right? Think of this kind of star anise flower, this disheveled explosion of flower parts kind of out there. But once we get to the Magnoliids, we see then a common evolution of a common ancestor then that had flower parts organized in parts of threes. As soon as we get to the eudicots, that common ancestor had flower parts organized in fours and fives. Elaborating then that theme enabled a tremendous diversity of different types of flowers. And we'll see that in a little bit. Okay, the rosids. What a cool clade. What an awesome clade. Incredibly diverse too. Rosids, again, now notice flower parts in fours and fives. The filaments then of stamens are now very clear. We start to talk about that stalk, that filament, and then we actually have the anthers then on top. Filaments are really well-defined. And so now once we get into the rosids, these are kind of your typical flower that you learn in your introductory botany class, right? This is this well-organized flowers. Our carpels, they still are uh, kind of separate, but now they tend to also be maybe fully fused together, right? So these carpels now start to instead be very separate. We can start seeing them become quite a bit fused. The petals are really distinct, all right? So now we have true petals, okay? We also have sepals on underneath, right? You can see kind of the green leaf-like sepals on the underside. We also have these very distinctive petals. 
And within the rosids, we have this very unique synapomorphy, something known as the hypantheum. Okay, what is the hypantheum? If you remember back, I talked about the hypantheum in terms of apples, okay? The apple as a fruit, what you're actually eating, eating in an apple is a swollen hypantheum, right? Apples are swollen hypantheums. All rosids are characterized by this hypantheum. And what the hypantheum is, is this fusion of the sepals and the petals to form this cup. So here are the petals, here are the leaf-like sepals, but they fuse to form this cup by which then the ovary and on the inside, the ovules then sit, okay? So the hypantheum is this cup then. And it's typical of anything within the rosids. So if you're familiar with roses, okay, this is a separate family, roses. Rose hips, right? If you know what a rose hip is, sometimes you know this. You you can sometimes you can eat rose hips. They're used in in kind of other really cool cool things. That is a swollen hypantheum, just like an apple. Okay, but rose hips are swollen hypantheums. In fact, a lot of aspects of rosed fruits are these elaborated hypantheums. So within the rose family, the fruit then is then this maturing and the swelling out and this infusion of sugars and other wonderful things into that fleshy tissue. That then makes up then the fruit of rosaceae and the rose family in general. Okay, evening primrose family. All right, here is another rosid. You can see very nicely here is this kind of fusion of the petals and then the sepals together to form this hypantheum type cup here. All right, here is a longitudinal cross section then through a fuchsia flower. And you can see then the petals and then the sepals coming together here to fuse to form then this tubular cup, okay? So you see this, almost this tubular flower, but this cup-like kind of formation, then that is the hypantheum itself. Right. Here's another kind of cross section then here where we have the petal right, and the sepal coming together, they're then fusing to form this tubular cup. That's the hypantheum right there. Hypantheums are really cool, and it's the synapomorphy then of the rosids. And so once you have a hypantheum, that enables you to do many things. In particular, notice how you can start to have a more elongate, elongated, somewhat tubular flower, okay? And you can form this tube and that can influence things like your pollinators who have to then access potential nectar being produced here at the base and entice them then for pollination, right? And so the hypantheum then can be elaborated either for pollination, but it can also then be used once you start to kind of inflate that hypantheum as then the seeds mature, you can then use then that tissue to make basically the fruit, okay? And entice animals then to disperse than your seeds. So the hypantheum has these many different functions. Another really cool family within the rosids, something known as Fabaceae, or the pea and the bean family. Right? A lot of Fabaceae turns out to be a lot of tropical trees, but they're also incredibly diverse in temperate zones as well. So many different diverse growth forms. You see a lot of peas and beans that are herbs, so Fabaceae that are herbs, vines, shrubs, and trees. Again, we start to see more elaborated flowers. Notice distinct filaments, distinct petals. We see um, sometimes elaborated structures as well. But what's really important for uh, within the Fabaceae, most tropical trees, it turns out, tend to be within the Fabaceae. So a lot of tropical forests, those species are kind of dominated then by these pea and bean family or the Fabaceae. So about 18,000 species then within uh, Fabaceae. And again, this is a dominant and diverse family, mainly within tropical forests. Pea flowers are very interesting. So kind of like orchids and monocot, we also see independent selection for kind of differing um, flower structures, in particular, this bilaterally symmetrical flower. And it turns out that 
within the Fabaceae, the pea family, we have tight coevolutionary relationships then with specific pollinators. Okay. And so we see these bilaterally symmetrical flowers, and then we see these elaborations. And don't worry so much about this, but if you take a taxonomy course, plant taxonomy course, you get into these uh, other details of how these petals then have been modified into these structures known as the keel or the wing, right? To give this very typical pea flower design. Okay. All right, Fabaceae, really cool. And here's the fruit, right? And so the Fabaceae or the pea family, it's also known as the legume family. And so the legume then is associated then with this fruit-like structure. Notice within Fabaceae, the pea family, we start to see a different type of leaf. Now, other plants also have this form, but within the Fabaceae, instead of having a simple leaf, we have what's known as a compound leaf. And so a compound leaf consists of all these different leaflets together, all attaching to this central stalk, right? We kind of knew that as the petiole, but there's another term it's known as the rachis. We'll come back to this later, but the leaf attaches here. And so you have this more finely divided lamina into what's known as a compound leaf, okay? Within the Fabaceae. Really cool group of plants. And again, if you take a plant taxonomy course, you'll learn much more about these structures. But here is this legume fruit, which looks like a pea. In fact, across all these different species, sometimes your typical pea, like you eat in like stir fry or something like that, right, peas. Um, they basically look kind of the same across all species. They're sometimes elaborated. Sometimes you get these big woody pea looking legume fruits or these more kind of fleshy fruits than that we like to eat, right? So here's then our typical pea. This is the legume, right? This is the fruit consists of a single carpal that opens then along these two seams to reveal then these maturing uh, seeds on the inside, right? So this then would be your, your ovules then on the inside. All right, so most species with compound leaves turns out tend to be rosids. So rosids have this other kind of modified leaf. It's not known as a simple leaf where we have a petiole and this simple lamina and the blade, but now we have this petiole leading into a structure known as the rachis and the blade itself is finely divided into these little leaflets. This is known as a compound leaf. So we have a simple leaf and a compound leaf. Okay. Also within the rosids, really cool group of plants. Oh my gosh perhaps the coolest group of plants, brassicales. So brassica, the mustards, these are mostly herbs, although you can get some tree-like things. Get these mustard oils. Mustard oils are typical. In fact, they're one of them, the synapomorphies and the brassicales. Mustards, broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, all right. Brussels sprouts, you know that smell of Brussels sprouts or broccoli or cabbage, right? That smell, that weird odor that you get, that is associated with mustard oils. Now, this is secondary chemistry, which is reflecting very deep, important coevolutionary relationships between plants and animals. We're going to come back to that. Another group of plants, papaya. Oh my gosh. Do you like papaya? I cannot stand papaya. It actually turns out that there are genetic differences between people in terms of whether or not you like eating papaya because within papaya, it turns out you see the evolution then of specific chemicals that are chemically equivalent to the bile in your stomach. So when I slice open a papaya, all I smell is basically vomit. And other people, it turns out, don't necessarily smell that or if they do, they're not repulsed by it. And it's an interesting genetic difference between people. But what's interesting is that that is a specific defensive chemical that actually is basically like your stomach acid. It's like the bile in your stomach, but it's used to defend then against insects boring in to these fruits. We'll talk more about this crazy secondary chemistry, but if you like papaya, good for you. I can't eat it. All right. Other things, wasabi, oh my gosh, wasabi, that smell of wasabi, if you, if you know what wasabi is, if you eat sushi, you get that green mustardy stuff, right? If you actually smell that, that's pure mustard oil. Right? Very, very 
kind of intense smell. And this is unique to this entire group of plants. And so it turns out that these mustard oils are called glucosinolates. Glucosinolates. We're going to be talking more about secondary chemistry later. Are typical then not only of this group, but they're reflecting basically the evolution of this chemical defense, this chemical warfare against insects in particular. All right, the rosids, really cool group of plants. Look at this. Oh my gosh, this is a drive by of the angiosperms here. Our next stop this other little clade, the Karyophyllales. You may think, what the heck is that? But you know what? You live in Tucson, Arizona. You are surrounded by the Karyophyllales. Oh my gosh, what a cool group of plants. Cactaceae, the cactus family, is within the Karyophyllales. If you um, are familiar with Bougainvillea, okay, the Nictangiaceae, they have this kind of this intense kind of pink color associated with them as well as within the Karyophyllaceae, the pink family. This is herbaceous groups of plants. This pink color, it turns out, is highly associated with the Karyophyllaceae. It's a cool group of plants consisting of these things like cactus all the way to bougainvillea, bizarre plants. Within the Karyophyllaceae, it turns out that the carpels are fused. All these carpels are fused together and you get this explosion then of ovules then on the inside and there's one big honking carpel and this big fused carpel all together. The placentation, that just refers to the ovary placement. Don't worry about that. Take a taxonomy course from that, but it's really unique. It's called free central placentation, but I don't expect you to memorize that at all. And so within then, the karyophyllales, we get this experimenting around this diversity then of where in the fusion then of these carpels, where then ultimately the ovules kind of end up. And so think of this as the placenta in terms of where then um, you get this arrangement then of our ovules within the maternal tissue okay, kind of surrounding. And so really diverse. And again, take a taxonomy course if you really want to, to get into the gory details about placentation within the karyophyllales. Karyophyllales are really cool because they actually don't have any petals. They don't have any petals. In fact, if you look at these flowers within karyophyllales, like cactus flower or other, other karyophyllale flowers, they look like they have petals, but actually these are petal-like parts of flowers derived from sepal, stamens, or floral bracts. Right. They tend to be these other parts of the flower that have been elaborated to look like petals. So within the Karyophyllales, sometimes we get these petal-like structures that are actually petaloid stamens. These are stamens that have been elaborated to look like petals for various reasons. Bougainvillea in particular, all that beautiful kind of purple or red, sometimes white of a bougainvillea flower is actually uh, these petal-like structures, these are bracts that have been elaborated to look like kind of petals, but they've been elaborated to kind of perform these petal-like functions. And if you actually look on the inside, you'll see this smallest white part then of the flower itself. These are elaborated sepals, okay? So the flower part is actually this other structure known as the bract and the sepals are on the inside. Crazy stuff. Within the Karyophyllales, you get these other interesting secondary chemical compounds known as betalane pigments. So things like if you're familiar with beets, okay, a beet is in the, the karyophyllales. If you slice open a beet or if you eat beets for, for dinner or, or whatever, you'll often get that red stain on your fingers or in your mouth, right? You can always tell somebody that likes to eat beets. And that is a, a stain associated then with the secondary compound. And it turns out to be very important in defining the karyophyllales. And so these are known then as betalanes. And so most karyophyllales uh, have this typical betalane that gives this deep pink or this deep red type color then to them that they are used in, and deployed in different ways. So that's a typical secondary chemistry kind of compound. We're gonna come back to secondary chemistry later. So I'm kind of foreshadowing a little bit. You also find anthocyanins uh, another uh, deep red color, typical then within the other angiosperms, but this deep red color within the karyophyllales are generated from this unique structure and this unique chemical compound known as betalanes. Right? 
So across the angiosperms, you can get the color red evolving either through anthocyanins or beta lanes. And within the karyophyllales, we see this red, purple, pink color coming from beta lanes. And it turns out then that across then the angiosperms, you can place this trait of this, where this red coloration comes from, kind of across then the phylogeny. And you can see then that um, there's this patterning then the beta lanes and anthocyanins kind of throughout the, the angiosperm phylogeny. But I don't want to get into that you know, right now. And so within the karyophyllales, you can do some very interesting additional taxonomy based on the presence of both beta lanes and anthocyanins. Don't worry so much about this, but again, a little bit of foreshadowing when we get the secondary chemistry and some encouragement that this is how, uh, if you want to jump into plant taxonomy, you can go into more detail here. Okay, so last group, big important group, the asteroids. Okay. Asteroids are cool because the synapomorphy for the asteroids turns out to be a fused corolla when all the petals then are fused together to form this tubular corolla, petals are fused. We're not getting a fusion then of the sepals and the petals, but when the petals are fused to form a tubular flower or this tubular corolla, that is the snapomorphy then associated with the asteroids, fused corolla. The stamens tend to be born then on petals and the stamens then differ in terms of being definitely less than the total number of petals then present. So we get kind of this reduction in terms of the number and of stamens. There tends to only be one style, that one kind of central stalk with the female reproductive then uh, parts and carpels then tend to be two. So if you slice open then the asterid, you'll see these two carpels, okay? So that's very typical then of an asterid group. But fused corolla, that is then, are kind of typical synapomorphy. So what are some groups? And again, I don't expect you to memorize these groups, all right? I only expect you to memorize the main synapomorphies for each of these main, these six main angiosperm groups. But I can go into a few details in terms of the types of, of plants and the wonderful families that we find within the asteroids. Lamiales, what a cool group of flowers. These flowers are also bilaterally symmetrical we tend to see these four stamens, okay, that are very typical, and kind of these two pairs, kind of too big and, and too small right there. And if you're into tropical trees, oh my gosh, uh, the big noniaceae, tababuya, or some of, you know, the acanthaceae, lamiaceae, if you're familiar with some of these families, kind of mints, right, um, plantain, you get these amazing verbenas. Oh my goodness, these are wonderful flowers. They all have the kind of the same look to them, this bilaterally symmetrical look, very typical of the Lamiales. Asteraceae, oh my goodness, perhaps the best. In fact, they, it's the largest family of ang angiosperms, 25,000 species of sunflowers, the sunflower family or the Asteraceae. And it's a crazy flower because it's actually not one flower. What you're actually looking at are multiple flowers altogether. What a crazy group of flowers these things are. In fact, if you actually take a typical sunflower family and you start taking it apart, what you actually find is that on the outside, what looks like all petals, each one of those are separate flowers. Each one then, what looks like a separate petal as you go around the sunflower, each one of those is a separate flower. And on the inside, if you zoom in on the inside and you see that there's a lot, a lot going on there. If you zoom in, each one of those, if you can pick them off, each one of those is a separate flower too. And so you see separate flowers in the heads and separate flowers all around the outside. A sunflower is this mega flower. It's crazy consisting of all these individual flowers. And so what's interesting is that these flowers are called disc flowers. They're very small, but they're all grouped together on the inside. Those are called disc florets. And then each of these, what looks like a separate petal, but it's not, that is one separate flower. That's known as a ray flower or a ray flower floret and a disc floret. And if you zoom in, you can see the ovary, 
You can see the corolla, there's your anthers, and there's your style, kind of all right there. In fact, you have to get a hand lens out to see all the details. So Asteraceae, or the sunflower family, crazy flowers, right? They're a grouping of all these different flowers kind of all together to form this mega flower, which is totally bizarre. Sometimes within the Asteraceae, we only see flowers that are just ray florets, okay? So if you're typical of maybe, um, if you're familiar with um, like lettuce flowers, okay? If you let your lettuce go then to, to flower and seed, you'll see um, its flowers. It only has ray flowers. Sometimes in thistles, which is also an Asteraceae, those consist of just disc flowers. Okay, these are just the disc flowers. These are just the ray flowers. And then here then is an Asteraceae flower that contains both the disc and the ray flowers together. Crazy group, right? Totally crazy group of flowers. Ah, another awesome Asterid, Rubiaceae, my personal favorite family because this is the coffee family. And we see these very typical Rubiaceae flowers. Again, we have this tubular corolla, okay, this fused tubular corolla. And we also see an inferior ovary. Don't worry so much about this but the flowers are radially symmetrical. And we tend to see the Rubiaceae dominating within tropical forests. And you can always identify Rubiaceae by their opposite leaves, opposite, opposite uh, uh, simple leaves. Um, and they tend to have this structure known as a stipule, this kind of leaf-like structure in between them, the different leaves. Don't worry about that, but for plant nerds out there, this is how you tell this wonderful family kind of apart. Now, this family is also rich in secondary chemistry, in particular alkaloids. Um, and so coffee, caffeine is an alkaloid. And that's very typical then of most species then found then within this group. Rubiaceae, very much a tropical family. We get, a, a, there's actually a few species here in Southeastern Arizona, but very much a tropical family. Ooh, another nasty secondary chemical family, Solanaceae tomatoes, potatoes, chilies, eggplants, tobaccos, and then deadly nightshade or datura. And if you go out uh, here in Southeastern Arizona at night, sometimes you'll run into datura. They tend to be growing around washes and you get these huge, look at this, tubular corolla. Okay, so this tubular corolla, right? Potatoes, deadly nightshade is in the, is in, uh, the potato family. And again, you tend to see these fused corollas often with lobes rich in alkaloids, all right? So Solanaceae can be very deadly, right? incredibly deadly because they have these nasty alkaloids. Again, secondary chemistry, we're gonna come back to secondary chemistry later. Chilies, Solanaceae. So how did the chili get hot? Well, it turns out that this is an alkaloid that likely evolved as an antifungal compound. But what's also interesting is that that capsaicin, that chemical, that alkaloid, turns out to be a really good mammal repellent. And so a really good defense, if you have a lot of mice, you know, or like uh, pack rats around your house, there's a lot of pack rats in Tucson, that if you sprinkle chili powder or chili seeds kind of all around where you suspect maybe the mice like to go and congregate, it's a big deterrent than a mice. In fact, um, when mice eat then the capsaicin, it's not only displeasant to them, but it also probably disrupts physiologically some of their internal workings of digestion. Now, we're a weird mammal because we actually um, kind of like that spice a little bit, but if you give capsaicin in the dosage then that a mouse or a small mammal would receive, it would be a very big repellent. And if you've ever had a big dose of really hot chili, Right? Imagine if that was your only dose of chili you've ever received, right? you'd probably avoid it for the rest of your life. And many people do. Many people can't take uh, the hot. But it turns out that capsaicin is really weird because birds love capsaicin. And so capsaicin turned out to be a wonderful compound to select against mammals so that we don't have any seed predation from mammals. But Birds love to disperse chili fruits. In fact, some of the 
Um, the first chili fruits before they did, were domesticated were very small and birds actually could gobble them up. In fact, birds will gobble up capsaicin like there's no tomorrow. It must taste good to them, who knows? Okay, alkaloids, nasty stuff, big, difficult biochemistry. And we have these nitrogen containing compounds. And again, these are derived from the amino acids. They're highly bio, bioactive. And we're gonna come back to how dangerous alkaloids can be, but also potentially promising because of a lot of our drugs turns out to be derived then from some of these plant alkaloids. All right, so a lot of secondary metabolites. Again, mo most used to defend against herbivores. Some of these have very psychoactive uh, um, kind of, uh, impacts on humans. And so some of these drugs can actually modify the behavior then of not only insects, but also of mammals as well. It appears to have evolved many times. Again, we'll come back to talk about secondary chemistry. But one thing I wanna kind of end with here, and that is the evolution of caffeine and caffeine-like compounds. So it turns out that the evolution then of caffeine is very interesting because there's a lot of structures, a lot of secondary chemistry that's very similar then to caffeine. So theobromine, so if you like uh, chocolate, okay, is actually chemically very similar, if not identical then to caffeine, okay? So you get a little caffeine-like hit if you eat chocolate. So coffee, theobroma, and chocolate, very similar secondary chemistry. Yerba mate, right? Some of this uh, ilex, cola, paulinia. We have these caffeine and caffeine-like compounds found throughout, it turns out, the angiosperms. And in fact, if we look at where the phylogenetic distribution of these ca caffeine-like compounds, if you look at tea, black tea, coffee, mate, um, cacao, and cola, they tend to be distributed then across the angiosperm phylogenies, but in these different groups. And it brings up the big question, has caffeine evolved once or multiple times? And I'm gonna come back to this later, but it actually turns out that it looks as if caffeine has likely evolved kind of multiple times across the land plant phylogeny, okay? So I'm gonna end here. We've now walked up the angiosperm phylogeny. And so next time I'm gonna summarize some of the main take home points of the angiosperm phylogeny. And so we're gonna be able then to put together the major patterns of angiosperm character evolution with that. And so what I would like you then to do is also go back to the questions for today. You should all be able to start answering each of these different questions. You should be able to make a chart and you should begin to summarize the main difference between the anita grade, the magnoliids, the rosids, all the way up to the asterids in terms of different flower parts, as well as some other attributes then of these, of these different taxa, clades and grades. Okay. You should be able to start to uh, kind of tell me some interesting aspects then of their kind of geographic distribution and where they tend to occur. So for example, palms, we talked about why palms tend to be restricted in terms of where they grow, right? And so why do palms only grow in the tropics and not in really cold regions, okay? So with that, We'll stop and don't hesitate to let us know if you should have any questions and we'll see you next week. Okay, so thank you everybody.